I start by saying, and I, I literally tell people this, send love beams out of your eyes. Welcome, listeners, to a special episode of To Debate, our podcast of debates. What's so special about this today? Well, I'm not looking only at Sebastian here, um, who is for a change in beautiful Switzerland at home. We are also connected with a guest uh, in New Hampshire. There is really no way for me to overstate how proud we are to have this opportunity. We have, uh, I've been told earlier that it's pretty uncommon for uh, somebody who's in the field of arguments and rhetoric to have a fan base, but at least right now we feel like uh, fanboys here. Um, our guest spent his entire career on building convincing arguments. He wrote a New York Times bestseller, Thank You for Arguing. And uh, he served clients from NASA to Walmart. So this alone, that span alone, NASA to Walmart makes me makes me giggly, I have to say. Um, he runs the geekiest rhetoric blog on the planet. He tries to time travel. And his latest book is How to Argue with a Cat, where you hopefully will tell us a little bit about it later. Uh, welcome, Jay Heinrichs. Do I pronounce your name right? Jay Heinrichs it is? You're one of the few people... <laughs> because of your origin, who can pronounce my name. Heinrichs is right. And I, Sebastian, I welcomed you as well. And you actually pronounced my name correctly. It is Sebastian too. Do you want to, do you want to give a shot at my last name? No, but uh, you can educate us here on the, on the podcast. How is your last name pronounced? You have a hyphenated name. It would be Clément. Yeah, but that's the easy part. That's the French part. That's my mother's maiden name. Don't try to cheat here. <laughs> My official name is indeed the first part, which is Szczynski. Szczynski. Yes, it's roughly. Polish, right? It is Polish indeed. My father's Polish. So, okay, the, so. The, the Polish folks cannot pronounce your French name properly and the French cannot pronounce your Polish name properly, right? And the irony is that uh, <laughs> because my first name is actually spelt with I-A-N at the end, Sebastian, it's actually another French spelling. And in France, they get confused because they know I'm French. So they spell my first name incorrectly too. With it. Anyway, I've had a disaster childhood. <laughs> <laughs> this is why you should come to America. People will call you Sebastian Trzinski. Yeah, and all yeah. is good. I, I have to agree with Jay. He won, he won that argument, hands down. Sorry, Sebastian. One zero for Jay. One zero for Jay. <laughs> what yeah, can I say? I think the Polish have been mispronouncing their own names for centuries now. Jay Heinrichs, where is the second name from? Is it actually German origin? Yes. Yes, I think that uh, my my great grandparents came from Bavaria at the age of sixteen, and they came alone. So the the generations have been downhill ever since. I once read that Germans are actually the least known and best immersed minority majority in the states. It's like forty million Americans uh, trace their origins back to some German ancestors. Yeah, it, it is it is amazing. And what people don't realize is how much the German community influenced the American Revolution on both sides. But in particular, George Washington went nuts trying to deal with the German American community uh, in the colonies at the time, which had their own agenda. So, and you know, it's interesting. You think about World War II. The United States eagerly locked up every Japanese American in concentration camps. Uh, and yet our head general was Eisenhower. So I talk about integration of Germans. You don't get better than that. <laughs> Reminds me of, uh, of a quote on the Ellis Island Museum. Uh, it's not by a German, but it's Italian immigrant from the 1920s because there were su successive waves of immigration in the U.S. from different parts of Europe. And I remember the, the quote from this Italian immigrant uh, was something like, I, I was told the streets of New York were paved in gold. Not only was there no gold, but I had to pave the streets myself. <laughs> Quite interesting to illustrate the American so-called dream back in the 20s, where, you know, you're sold that, you know, very slick image, but actually have it yet there's the entire nation to be built still in the early 20th century. You know, it's funny. That sounds a lot like I, I imagine one of his descendants was our current German-American president, Donald Trump. We had a few debates actually inspired by Trump or about Trump. He comes up regularly, even if the debate is, is not connected to him. 
Uh, I think it reminds me, uh, what's the name of this uh, of this law on the internet? The one which which refers back to Nazis. Oh, yeah. Like oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Discussion. yeah. It's named after a guy who actually coined this for the first yeah. Usen- Usenet and forums in the, in the early 90s, where basically every discussion online would veer off, inevitably, whatever the topic, Godwin's law Hitler and Nazi accusations. Sorry? God, Godwin's law. Exactly, Godwin. Godwin's law. Yeah, yeah that's Godwin's it, law. that's it. Yeah. So it's the it's the Trump law, basically. Most of our debates, whatever the discussion, whether we talk about the cloud, whether we talk about freedom of expression, whatever it is, it always veers off. Or very often, let's say, I'm a bit sarcastic here, but it often veers off towards Trump and uh, and his uh, behavior. Oh, absolutely. He sucks more oxygen out of the earth than climate change. <laughs> <laughs> so. Did you come across any of our Trump influence debates when you were when you when you were picking and choosing some of the debates to look into? I did. I I did listen to a part of one. Yeah, and and got so depressed I stopped. I I like the the style of your debates. which is very conversational, but I I like the way you guys actually do formal debates. I love that. Yeah. That, on that note, to somebody who studied rhetoric and. Uh, everything around rhetoric from, is there actually any rhetoric be- before the ancient Greeks? I was about to say from the ancient Greeks to today, I assume people before the ancient Greeks also spoke and had rhetoric uh, as, a, as a school, right? Yeah, there's plenty of evidence that the ancient Jews had rhetoric schools that probably heavily influenced the Greeks. And then there's some evidence that Chinese had formal schools of rhetoric as well that, that predates Greece. I, I I think that we're one of the few cultures that really don't universally teach elite children um, the the roles of uh, persuasion. And that is a really interesting observation, right? So uh, you might you might say that at least there's a lot of rhetoric practice going on in, in our media influenced world these days. So a lot of rhetoric is put in action. And I assume that Successes like the ones that Trump has right now is heavily influenced by him deploying successfully rhetoric devices and uh, picking his words wisely. But we we don't have a formal education around that. How did that come to be? Well, it, it, the problem, I think, started actually in Germany. It's all your fault. Um, the, the, the schools in America, and I can, I can talk about American rhetoric at least, uh, were originally founded around rhetoric. Up until the 1800 or the early 1800s, you actually had to memorize Marcus Tullius Cicero's prosecution speeches against Catiline. It was your entrance exam. You had to recite them in Latin uh, in order to get into one of the best colleges in America. The problem was that rhetoric was associated with the classics of ancient Greek and, and Latin. And so along in the late 18th century, This man named George Tickner studied the German university system and came back saying, hey, why don't we study things like science <laughs> and, you know, and like useful stuff and modern languages. And so the American university largely dropped rhetoric from its curriculum because it was associated with Greek and Latin. It's undergoing a revival now in the United States, and I see a revival going on in Britain. I mean, really around the world now, people, there's more and more interest being stimulated in the rhetoric, in part because we see how much goes wrong when we don't know it. Has there been something like formal debates, like going in rounds or having something that resembles Oxford-style debates? There was a com- heavy competition in ancient Greeks for uh, dem- what's called demonstrative or epideictic rhetoric, but that was speech making. So speeches were as popular as theater back in the day, uh, but it was speeches. The interesting thing about those speeches was that they tended to be much shorter than people think. You know, in the 19th century, American politicians were speaking for two hours and crowds loved them. Because what else was there to do, I guess? But the thing about Greeks being Greeks, and they're still like this, I think, at least judging from cab drivers in Athens, um, are constant talkers. And so you would have these Greek speakers barely able to get out a sentence without being heckled. Now, often you would have a sort of back and forth, but it was much less formal. So formal rules of debate 
didn't really come along until like the Renaissance. I mean, it was, and, and it's more of an enlightenment kind of deal that you get these formal debates now with rules and people going back and forth. And in part, because I think that that's a sign that people kind of forgot rhetoric, actually. Formal debate is more about dialectic. It's, it's trying to discover the truth instead of trying to make choices together or actually persuade. I'm often asked to help with debating clubs, and I often say no, because while I love listening to them, and I love what you guys do, I actually think that, you know, most rhetoric goes on without people actually talking. But isn't the, the current style of, let's say, shouting matches and arguments we see on, on services like Twitter, isn't that more a debate style where you don't accept an interruption? If, again, Trump goes one at one of his Twitter storms, I doubt that he even reads any of the replies he gets. It's, uh, or, and if he does, it certainly doesn't, doesn't stop him from putting out his argument and not paying attention to what he gets back. Yeah, that's a persuasion by volume, and it's very tribal. So, you know, it's you're preaching to your own choir. And, and there's, a, there's a lot of debate about how effective that actually is. I mean, he, as, as we said earlier, you know, everything comes back to Trump. We, we hate doing it. It still comes back to Trump. Uh, and so it shows you that, you know, what uh, an amazing pulpit this guy is able to speak from. Using the word pulpit with, in regard to Trump is a strange thing in the first place, but that Twitter is his pulpit. And the idea of him just sitting there on his toilet with his smartphone influencing the world that way drives a lot of people justifiably crazy. That being said, you know, I think that he's not being very effective this way. He looks like an idiot. Um, he contradicts himself constantly. And plus, you can, you, everybody now can trace back everything he said and can immediately retweet all his old tweets saying the opposite of what he says today. So, you know, is it a debate? No. I mean, not in real time, certainly. And I don't think it's a debate at all. You know, it's basically him reflecting what he sees on Fox and Friends at, on Fox News TV. Uh, now, when people push back on Twitter, they're speaking to their own tribes. And so you have an audience disconnect. So the great thing about a debate that happens in front of a single audience is that you have a single audience <laughs> that, you know, you're both reaching the same audience and increasingly with asynchronous debate, you're reaching very specific audiences. I mean, it used to be, I still am the editorial director of a magazine with a monthly circulation of, of five and a half million people. I, we, this magazine is dying because we can't get advertising. Instead, you know, people want to, us to go online and appeal to audiences that if, if, if it's 200,000 people is considered massive. Increasingly, we're talking in my business of audiences of 5,000 to 10,000 people, these tiny micro audiences, and they're not speaking to each other for the most part. That's why so much persuasion takes place outside debate, because you don't have the same audiences. Yeah, that was one of the inspiration Sebastian had when we had the first talk about this debating podcast idea to actually present more sides than just your own opinion and have a way to really balance out sides of the argument. And for us, it was very interesting to also sometimes convince ourselves because uh, we, we do flip a coin to decide on which side we are on. Just recently, we talked about that we remember many of our debates and they, they even come up in our daily lives, but we sometimes don't even recall what side we were on. And by now we are so so trained in switching sides that we we also find convincing arguments for whatever side we pick. And I think one key point to add to what you're saying here, Dirk, is uh, in this attempt to take the other side's opinion, is even even if initially we're forced we're forced to take that other side's opinion by the flip of the a flip of the coin, what's interesting is that we try to come up with arguments which are still in harmony with our with our core philosophy. Right? We will not try to bring arguments which are maybe obvious but don't resonate with us. So this is where it becomes very interesting because we realize how we can even convince ourselves to the point, as Dirk was mentioning, that over time, if we have to recall our initial posi our, our latest position on the topic, we may actually not even remember. We may remember maybe the very initial uh, position, but we, not re we, we may not remember if we switched or if we kept that position because we were so convinced 
with our own arguments and trying to, as part of this exercise, that we actually forgot what was the initial position. So that was the, the interesting bit about using language and trying to use arguments which still resonate with us. And, I, and that also I found quite interesting because I thought it would be, it would prove impossible to actually try to have another side's opinion while still resonating with my own core philosophical tenets of what I usually believe in. That makes a really interesting point, I think, which is that a lot of times when we disagree, we disagree for entirely tribal reasons and not necessarily reasons that come to the core of our own personal philosophies. And, you know, it's interesting that you bring this up because just before our session today, I was doing a uh, video chat with a high school class. And I do this a couple times a week for classes that adopt my book. And what the, stu the students had run out of questions to ask me. And so one of them said, hey, can we have a debate? And I said, sure. What would you like to talk about? And this is a school in Connecticut, which is where, you know, the worst, one of the worst mass shootings in American history, where they shot up an elementary school, a, a shooter killed a number of elementary school students took place. And so Connecticut now has one of the strictest gun control laws in the country. I said, let's make this debate specifically about why 18-year-olds shouldn't be allowed to buy automatic weapons. And the whole place erupted. It was so much fun. I mean, they were shouting at me and, you know, how come, how come we could serve in the military and die for you, but you won't let us have our own guns? And it's funny because this whole class was pretty much pro gun control until I brought up the fact that they shouldn't be allowed to buy guns. <laughs> so, which is absolutely so much fun. So, uh, and I won, by the way, or at least I told them I did. <laughs> <laughs> so, so is there a system to actually winning? Because you touch on it. Because what we also, uh, what Sebastian and I also tried to set up is a bit of a game. Our audience can vote on who was more convincing to them, which is interesting because we have some people actually coming back to us and telling us, yeah, I was convinced by Sebastian originally, but then this and that was the winning argument. To be fair, that doesn't happen as often as we would love it to happen, but it, it does happen that people listen to the whole thing and switch their mind. And uh, so it, it makes me wonder... Is, it, is there a system to, to beat Sebastian more often, to put it bluntly, or uh, to be more convincing to our audience? Is there like a, a magic sauce? I mean, you're, what, I, I read somewhere that you're a persuasion consultant. So um, if you have any superpower tricks, don't tell them here. Send them to me secretly. I need <laughs> to have more points against Sebastian. But just joking, of course. Um, are there any systems? Well, first of all, before I take on a client, As a, and most and I make a living as a persuasion consultant. That's where most of my income comes from. God knows it doesn't come from books. <laughs> But the uh, uh, one of the things I insist on is data. So I'm I'm a total data geek when it comes to the tools of persuasion. Because who knows whether Aristotle was actually right? You know, he he had some really good ideas how, about how to film a movie. You know, if you read his poetics. But is he really good at this rhetoric persuasion thing? So one of the things I was looking at with you guys is it would be really cool to come up with a sway index, which would be have people register their opinions in advance and maybe even let them comment so that you really get them, you know, to frame their own beliefs in their own personal identity. And then see how many people change their minds, and that would be your sway index. That would be the that would be the actual win. And so, if if you get only two people to do it, um, but the last time only one person did, that's a that's a sway index performance factor of a hundred percent. So so that would be you know if I'm when I look at what I do in my consulting work. I often find that the stuff that I really thought would perform the best perform the least. Uh, one of the best things to do uh, in terms of if you're in front of an audience, and especially if it's video, is to be better looking. <laughs> well, then Sebastian always wins. That's, that's, not, that's not a fair fight. The other thing I tell uh, women, actually, who tend to do worse in any uh, argument in front of an audience is 
you know, there's lots of research that shows that having a higher tone of voice is considered less trustworthy, both among male and female audiences. And, but I, I tell women, because there's also research that shows this too, don't worry about lowering your voice an octave, which it sounds weird, you know, and can actually sound sexy, which can be even weirder. Instead, speak in a monotone. So I tell women, uh, and I think this applies to men who, like me, tend to inflect their voice too much, you know, going way up and way down which women do more than men do, watch every George Clooney movie, especially Ocean's Eleven, because Clooney speaks in a monotone. He has a fairly deep voice, but what makes him more effective and makes him seem more trustworthy is that he uses timing to emphasize certain words. And if you look at Ocean's Eleven, you know, he will time the most important words of all. And that's the important thing here. It really is timing. That's, you know, he has these little tiny, you know, micro pauses in his sentences rather than say timing, you know, which is what I would do, which is, makes me entirely untrustworthy to audiences. Maybe uh, to the risk of being slightly off topic, have you seen anything, any shift in, in how people perceive what you just said about maybe the, this difference in gender and how, you know, women or men, or maybe the, the more specific point you're, make, you're making about the higher, lower pitch of a voice how has this been taken maybe since, you know, all the Me Too movement and the various uh, articles in the press about, you know, making gender uh, comments, which may or may not be stereotypes? Do you have any opinion on that or have you seen any reaction with the audiences you've been training? Do you know what's interesting to me is the, the, the dramatic shift in tone throughout all American audiences, right and left, everybody in between, if there is anybody in between anymore. What what is interesting to me though is that there's still a kind of disconnect, and I'm I'm curious to know what's going to happen next. Up until the Me Too movement, it was all about the women's behavior. So you know, women weren't getting respected in uh, meetings. What should women do about that? You know, how can they change their tone? Is there something about their posture? Is there a way they enter the room? Are they dressing properly? How do they get men to pay attention to them in a respectful way? With the Me Too movement, the shift now is on the men's behavior or misbehavior, as the case may be. And so women are now sort of standing there, arms akimbo, saying, what are you going to do, men? You know, this isn't about how I behave. It's all about your behavior. Men are not really saying anything about that. I mean, there, there's now men are kind of in a state of shock, like, oh, my God, <laughs> I wonder what I did a few years ago that may have been offensive or horrible or whatever. And so I do see men starting to shift their behavior to get out of trouble, but I'm not seeing ways for men to get more respect from women. And women now are basically shutting down the conversation about how to behave better in meetings. Uh, because they're saying, look, I'm, I am who I am. Men have to deal with it now. So I get a lot of pushback now from women saying, look, you know, rhetoric is about appealing to audiences. It's about their beliefs and expectations. And I start with the motto of rhetoric, at least as I see it, which is it's not about you. Women justifiably are saying, yeah, actually, it is about me, <laughs> you know, and it's about men's behavior toward me. And I think that those stories are really interesting, but we're almost in a liminal period now where something's got to happen where people start changing their behavior. And I'm not seeing that yet. I mean, if it's simply a, a matter of men trying not to get in trouble, that's not quite the conversation we need to have yet. Does that make sense? I think it does. Also, we are probably a little bit too early to tell if that also will change perception of men versus women, right? So some of that, that what you described, that speaking in a lower tone, maybe ending your uh, words that you want to emphasize on the low end instead of the high end, all of that also could have some roots in being man-controlled, man-driven. And so that's the more trusted, powerful type of speaking. And I think it might just be too early to say if we change that habit, because I assume maybe maybe that's wrong, but I, I, I'm assuming that this is mostly a cultural practice that we learn what we consider being trustworthy language and less so, right? 
I don't know. And I don't know that anyone knows how much of this is culture and how much of this is somehow, you know, inculcated biologically. It seems universal across cultures. But on the other hand, if you look at almost every culture, they're dominated by males. So, you know, I think that the change agents here are women and will be women. But women, as much as men, I mean, the, the data are almost identical, trust a deeper, more monotonal voice than they do a more inflected, higher voice. You know, we've had the feminist movement around for how many decades now? and haven't seen a significant change in the response to tone. On the other hand, a few decades are not that much compared to a few thousand years of patriarchy. So we, we probably should allow it some more time. That comment actually brings the, this topic to my mind about humor. We as, and again, this may be, I, I don't know if I'm correct on that, but I do feel that in Europe, we have a propensity, at least in France, to joke quite easily, especially on the workplace. And it's quite clear to me that some of the jokes of the humor that we use on the workplace in France would not be acceptable in an American uh, culture. So I'm, I'm curious as to your, to your thoughts about how to handle humor. You know, how much humor is good? Especially in the light of uh, our debate, since we try to persuade people to vote for us on, on the debating page. So is it good to actually joke or be emotional or when is it good to joke and when should we drop it? So there is, there is a, you know, humor can be sliced into all kinds of very unfunny segments. You, you know, there, there is humor based on wordplay. There's humor based on to tribal behavior. So being funny absolutely correlates with people's identif identity with you. Um, women and men alike, people of all cultures love someone with a sense of humor. And, and, and respond really well to that. I think, I think that one thing that made Trump relatively successful as a politician is that he can be funny, especially to his particular audiences. Um, and, and what makes him even more appealing to these audiences is the fact that so many people hear the same things and think it's, they're very unfunny. So all this comes down to the rhetorical principle that it depends on the audience. Now, I, I have to say, every time I'm in Europe, I am appalled when I watch sports on television and hear the commentators talk about uh, people of African origin <laughs> using nicknames like Chocolate Thunder. You do that in the United States and your job is gone. I mean, your <laughs> career is dead. And it's, you know, so it's a very like and it makes me wonder, <clears throat> what do these guys think of this? Like the people who are given these nicknames. Um, uh, there, there, interestingly, that has a very heavy cultural background, right? We simply don't have the kind of tensions around race that uh, you have in the States. We don't have that history of especially the clash, people of color and, uh, and the white people. So uh, we don't have that sense of privilege and clash. Uh, maybe that is also varying over the countries in Europe. So it's a different story in France than it is in Germany. That makes us being at ease with some kind of attributes. But get, getting back to humor, I mean, one of the things I tell people is if you want to appeal to a particular audience, especially one that's not like you, and being a 62-year-old white guy who speaks to college and high school audiences all the time, I'm increasingly unlike my audience. I start by saying, and I, I literally tell people this, send love beams out of your eyes. Like, I, I will, before I go on with an audience, I'll say, I love these people no matter how uncomfortable I may feel with that audience, I'll tell myself, I love these people. And I'll keep telling myself that. And then I'll go on and pretend I love them, you know? And after a while, you see people respond to them and there is a kind of bond that develops. And when it comes to humor, I start with that. I start by saying, am I really loving my audience here? When I'm, t when I'm speaking to these people, am I really showing the love? And with most audiences I speak to, they're a diverse audience. So I'm going to offend somebody, you know, if I use any kind of humor that uses anybody as a victim. And so, you know, I'll do it for love. So self-deprecating humor is my go-to because I'm, <laughs> I'm a privileged 62-year-old white guy, a, a part of the boomer generation of Americans that has managed to do everything it could to destroy America. So there's plenty of, of fodder for humor that I can go to just making fun of myself. And people love it. I mean, that people love having somebody with my 
you know, sense of privilege, make fun of myself. I assume that any kind of humor that picks a victim that's not ourselves is probably bad for our side and our argument. And uh, well, me making fun of Sebastian doesn't win me that much scores in, in the in the debate as well and vice versa. But that's probably the, the, the kind of humor that works better. Is there a good place for this? Is there, if we want to use it as a tool, does it kill the, the energy that uh, that uh, pulls somebody over to my side if I make a joke in the end? Or is it just fortifying my little speech I prepared and making me uh, race through the, the, through the finish line? Is there anything to humor that's useful in a tooling kind of way? A month or so ago, I did this on stage event with this really popular author in America, Gina Barreca. She's a good friend. She's a feminist scholar at the University of Connecticut. And she wrote this great best-selling book called, they used to call me Snow White, but I drifted, women's strategic uh, use of humor. And so Gina is an expert in what jokes are funny and what aren't funny <laughs> to a feminist. And she's also genuinely funny. She's the only person with a PhD ever elected to the legendary Friars Club of comedians. All the most famous comedians have been elected to the Friars Club and, and Gina Barreca, genuinely funny person. So we were on the stage for this event title, and it was at the Mark Twain House in Connecticut. And the title of the session was How to Take a Joke. And I started by telling a joke. How many feminists does it take to screw in a light bulb? And the answer is, that's not funny. And you could hear the eyes roll in the auditorium. Like, it was so thoroughly unfunny <laughs> to that to that audience. I, I lost them from the start. Now, this wasn't exactly a debate because we're... We're really good friends and very supportive of each other. But even Gina, like, she just rolled her eyes. Like, that isn't funny, you know? But so is there a way to tell a joke in a way that will let people appreciate the audience? And one of the things that I look at a lot is being sort of surprise meta in a surprising way. Like, t t talk about the humor in a way that's funny. Uh, I know this sounds absolutely crazy, but, you know, there are some words that you absolutely can't say in America, like the N word. You know, I literally can't say that without getting myself in serious trouble. So I like talking about the magic of words and, and I like to encourage audiences like, okay, what other words can't we say? So George Carlin used to have this great routine. You know about that? Like the words he can't say on the radio. Yeah. Now you can say every single one of those words on the radio. At the time, you could say the N-word on the radio and be just fine. Now you say that and you're, you're off the stage. So, I, you know, I think talking about why things are offensive and being funny about that is the ultimate, most sophisticated way. Of, of winning over an audience. And it's, it's obviously really hard to do. But if you look at a lot of the, com the, the most successful comedians today, starting with Louis C.K., who God bless him, <laughs> back before he proved to be a jerk, um, was, was one of the most successful comedians, he would talk about humor. He would talk about the use of humor and what's offensive and what's not, and do it in a really profoundly interesting and genuinely funny way. I, I I will never be able to do that, but I but I try. It's interesting if you work like us as Europeans in an American company, and we have a lot of international cultures coming together uh, at meetings, and uh, we we meet each other on a regular basis. It's interesting to see because you mentioned it's also a tribal factor and the bonding factor to have humor. It's interesting to see how people behave when they are let's say, out of their comfort zone, visiting America, where they know there are some language-related rules they are not completely sure how to comply with. And then if you see a bunch of um, uh, uh, Europeans around, you there is an increase in inappropriate joking that you might be able to <laughs> to, to spot. So uh, I, I like to say that some of the of offensive jokes you can hear out of European mouth in America wouldn't actually be told or not even be as funny 
on European soil. It's mostly like uh, two Europeans or several Europeans signaling to each other, hey, we, the two of us or the five of us, we are the safe zone here. We can make this joke and still are not pitchforked out of here. And it makes American colleagues sometimes very uncomfortable, uh, um, even if they're in, uh, let into the joke and understand the context of it. So I was thinking about this particular part of uh, weird cultural behavior that I can observe as a traveler between cultures at times. That's really interesting. I, I wonder if it partly has to do with um, uh, uh, Americans are very uncomfortable with being uncomfortable. I mean, we are we are the most comfortable nation and we love it and we identify with comfort. I mean, we, uh, we invented the reclining chair. I mean, that's how awesome we are. <laughs> One of the things I, I see in, in Europe, including the UK, is you want to make an audience laugh, make them uncomfortable. So the biggest laugh I, I've ever gotten anywhere was actually in London a couple of weeks ago when I was on stage with a thousand people in the audience and it was for Penguin UK, the publishing group. And I came on stage after all these truly amazing authors who had done these great works of literature and had given these little profound talks or been interviewed by this top BBC person. I was supposed to get go, go on stage for a little like light humor in between And you, here I am, you know, I, I was hanging backstage with famous authors and they were like, oh, so what book have you written? <laughs> It's like how to argue with a cat. And you can see just be, people just walk away when I would say that. So I go on stage and I and I had people first all start purring. Now, everybody go like this. Mm. Just do it. That wasn't loud enough. Mm. Mm. What do you think we're doing? We're purring. Now, let's take it a little farther. You can open your eyes. Lean in toward each other, the person next to you, and do it again. <laughs> Come on. Purr. Come on, people. This is serious. Purr. Don't you feel the love when you do that? And then I told them to lick each other on the backs of their necks. All right, we're still experimenting here. So now lean in again toward each other and sniff the other person. <laughs> Is somebody, good, good. Now, Gently lick them on the back of their back. And that made them so uncomfortable. I could, I almost, so this is very strictly timed. You can see how uncomfortable I am even doing this. But um, the, the, the laughter went on so long. I actually, the, the director off stage was going like this, you know, because I was using up too much. I was like, I can't do anything. They're just laughing. <laughs> And that was, you know, it was interesting to me was that I deliberately did that because I had realized in many unsuccessful attempts to get people to laugh uh, outside the United States, that making people uncomfortable when you're not in the US is the best way to do it. Now, if I had told an American audience to look each other in the back of the neck, they would have killed me. I mean, there would have been somebody well-armed in the audience who just would have <laughs> shot me right down. Maybe do you, have, uh, do you have examples of maybe the best use or the worst use of emotions? Because uh, I'll explain why I also uh, touch upon the topic. I often realize when I prepare my debates with Dirk that although my tendency is to be very data-driven, I'm very rational at work. I do realize that my tendency during live speeches is to use a lot of emotions, emotional arguments, which if I, if I was not improvising as much or if I was not giving a live presentation, I would probably shy away from. I would stick to numbers. I would stick to very rational, well-constructed arguments. And upon listening again to the recording, sometimes I realize that maybe the emotional argument is maybe not the most convincing. It works great in a live setting. But then if you reflect upon it, it's actually not very meaty. There's not much to it. 
So what's your take on that? And maybe you know, if you can provide some good or bad examples of using emotions in different contexts, I don't know. You know what's your observation? Well, you know, there are several emotions that tend to be used the most in per- persuasive situations, whether they're live or whether they're strategic, you know, over social media or whatever. You want to sell a car to uh, a retired dentist in America, put a beautiful woman beside the car. You know, the guy lusts for the woman and he buys the car. More effective, especially these days when it comes to things like politics or bringing emotion into any kind of uh, political debate, is fear. And so we are in a very fearful time, and so fear is especially um, effective. Show a dim, dark future that's being caused by your enemy, and that's, you know, that's going to be very effective. Ultimately, though, when you talk about the difference of occasion between giving a presentation at Google, say, and, you know, doing these debates, you're talking about a third element, of course, of rhetoric, which is ethos, which is how people will receive you. You know, are they going to like and trust you? And so in an entertainment forum, which whether you like it or not, you're part of right now, you know, emotion is going to be a way for getting people to identify you and to like you and and maybe find you trustworthy. You have emotions. You're not Mr. Spock. You know, you're somebody who can be related to. On the other hand, when you're at Google, the important thing is, you know, what is your phronesis? What is your practical wisdom? Are you coming up with solutions for a particular problem? And so bringing emotions into that are not going to work. All that being said, though, when I teach presentation skills and how to win business through presentations, I always talk about the fear of presentation at the beginning. So you always you start up with start out with a fear statement, which is here's what you're missing and why you should be concerned about that. It's often called a threat statement, but I like fear better because it, it, it plays to an emotion. And the fear I go after when I go, give presentations to, to sort of t- to talk about rhetoric and to try to bring it back into education in America is I play to smart people's fear of not knowing stuff. So, you know, I may be giving a, a very logical sounding argument, but I'm starting with that insecurity that people feel. So we, I had a couple of occasions in our debates, which is now 37 or something like that, where I felt like I killed my own argument by making a joke in the end. So it was actually, you know, I in, instilled fear. I got everything. I, I got the whole scenario painted. And I had, I, I felt by listening to myself, my own brilliant argument, I had Sebastian painted into the darkest possible colors. Um, or his argument, that is. And then I make a joke in the end and it falls flat. And I think uh, what I took out of that was uh, being being purposeful about what emotions we appeal to and in what context we put them is probably a good good tactic, right? Yeah, so think ethos first. I mean, Aristotle, I think, was right in saying that is the most powerful tool of persuasion, whether you can get an audience to like and trust you. So, you know, the three factors involved there, as Aristotle put it, and again, this is borne out with a whole lot of data, is whether people think you know what you're doing, what you're talking about, whether you have a solution to a particular occasion and have the learnings to go behind it, uh, whether you have the audience's best interest at heart. And then finally, do you have some higher cause you represent? And if you can get those three things down, you can win over an audience regardless of what kind of jokes you're telling. If those jokes undo any of those factors, those three factors of ethos, then you're screwed. You've lost. Now, on the other hand, you have the celebrity factor, which is where people will say, oh, I always agree with Sebastian, but I I like Dirk. So, um, you know, there, the big thing to think about in terms of any persuasion is what's the long-term relationship with your audience, whether it's a spouse or a partner or, or an entire large audience online. And, you know, the thing to think about is not necessarily whether you're convincing people of the particular point at hand, but whether you can get people to follow you over the long run and being funny is a great way to do it. You may lose the argument in the short run, but you may win as a person. On that note, on a similar note, actually, um, using humor, using emotions, 
I have a third area that I, I was curious about. We can easily structure arguments in a way that's actually flawed. Uh, we do that a lot, like using slippery slope. Like uh, we try to make a point how dangerous North Korea is. So we basically say, if we don't act now, Kim Jong-un is clearly crazy and we're going to end up in nuclear war. That's basically the, the kind of slippery slope that we are painting. Of course, that's not true. That's not the real world, but it is an argument to make. Is that a proper use of tools or is that evil or somewhere in the middle? Are there good and bad tools like this? You know, slippery slope is a, is a particularly tricky kind of fallacy because it's, it's not necessarily fallacious in all circumstances. Now, it can be used uh, simply to instill fear in people's hearts. So, for example, you know, banning automatic weapons to people who beat their wives in America will eventually lead to jackbooted thugs taking everybody's handgun away. That is a slippery slope fallacy that a lot of people believe. So in rhetoric, if people believe it, if it convinces them, then it then it's good. You know, so rhetoric is an amoral discipline. Getting rid of fallacies will never happen. Um, some of my best friends are fallacies. I don't want to get rid of them all. What I teach instead of fallacies is Aristotle's enthymeme, which is this sort of two-part logical system that he put together just for day-to-day -day rhetorical purposes. And that has to do with the proof and the conclusion, whether the proof makes sense, whether the conclusion is the one choice or the right number of choices, and whether the two are connected. That's all you need to know. And if you think about that, it's like if we ban automatic weapons to people who have beaten their wives, is that a reasonable thing to do? You know, that will keep women from being shot by abusive men to, to some degree. You know, that would be the conclusion. Does the proof make sense? You know, th does one lead to the other? That's what you should be debating. And if somebody says, well, then pretty soon jackbooted thugs will be taking our handguns away. Then you can say, well, wait a minute. The, the proof here is that, you know, men who have beaten their wives are more likely to shoot their wives. We have a lot of data on that. Now, does, does taking the guns away from those people somehow make it so that handguns are taken away from people? The proof doesn't lead to the conclusion. So you never have to mention slippery slope there. The greatest response to anyone in pointing out a fallacy is to is to say very logically, well, you're stupid. That <laughs> works every time. I'm I'm very sure that this is a good tactic for us. I, I have to tell you one more thing. I I, I actually one of the my, my most profound rhetorical moments was when I was in high school. Somehow I had gotten elected head of the student government. I think I was the only person who ran. And um, I found that not only I was really was I really bad at it, but I just hated the job of running this this high school student government. So I remember giving this rant about how nobody's helping around here. This is just stupid. I can't get anything done. Right in the middle of my rant, this beautiful redheaded woman named Paula. Um, very quietly said, Jay. And I said, what? She said, we love you. And I was just like flabbergasted. I don't think I could, I, I don't think I got anything out from that, from them. Now, what she committed was actually a logical fallacy. <laughs> and yet it brought the whole room together. You know, people were laughing at me because I must have blushed, you know, a thousand shades of red and, <laughs> and couldn't get anything out. And But she transformed the whole mood of the room. And that was the best fallacy I've ever heard and made me very pro-fallacy. Yeah, and I don't know that, I mean, ever since that, I've wondered, did she really love me? Sebastian, you're we're unmuting yourself. No, I was just thinking about all the crazy things I have said in our previous recordings and how I'm so thankful that Dirk edits things out. <laughs> and it's still, no, I, I am just worried that what, what he's keeping on the side, uh, you know, for blackmail. And I'm just imagining how, you know, he's already thinking, ah, ha, ha, I'm going to keep this little segment about Jay talking about this beautiful woman and red hair 38 years ago. Uh, so I'm just, uh, that's what I was thinking. That's all. <laughs> Yeah, don't don't think my wife hasn't heard that story though. 
I don't think that you share any secrets here. The best we can hope for is that we ask you a few questions you haven't had that many times before. Yeah, you know who um, you know who consistently ask me questions that flummox me, that I just don't have an answer for and have never heard before, and it happens almost every time, is high school students. High school students love to ask me, what arguments have I lost? And of course, I lose arguments all the time. So I think I was going to mention there, there was something my wife, my wife wins more arguments than she loses with me because she's a very convincing, she's a fundraiser. So she has this very charming way of arguing, whereas I'm more, you know, into the sort of debate mode of arguing. She's the kind of person you have to be prepared for because she is always the most prepared person in any meeting. Uh, it's why she's so successful at what she does. She has the legitimate job in the family. Um, so, so I came to her having done all this research. We wanted to, we'd been saving up for five years to go for a special anniversary last time around. I don't know why our 37th had to be special, but <laughs> maybe it's because we started thinking about saving five years before. Anyway, so I decided that we needed to go to this wonderful eco resort in Nicaragua. Really beautiful place. And so I was using what Aristotle called the advantageous argument, which is, you know, what would be to her advantage? What were the things she wanted that I would argue for? So I talked about how, you know, the, the amazing flowers. She's a botanist by training. I didn't tell her it was an eco resort in Nicaragua. I was talking about this place and I was going to sum up what it was at the end. And so she said, when I talked about all these wonderful flowers, she said, oh, yeah, I love gardens. And I'm thinking, I don't think there are any gardens at this eco resort, but maybe. OK. And so then I said, you know, and the wildlife's going to be incredible. She loves wildlife. And she said, yeah, I love animals, especially sheep. And I'm thinking, I I'm pretty sure there are no sheep in this thing. So it would go on, and every every time I mentioned a word, she reframed it with a with a turn on that one word. So I talked about hikes, and she said yes, walks, and so on. It went on and on until, in the end, I found myself agreeing to go to the rainy, cold Cotswolds of England, which is what she wanted to do all along. So she had managed to reframe everything I said and said, you know, really, what you've just described. Let me show you this place online. This is an amazing place in the middle of Cotswolds of England. Well, we ended up hiking 18 miles through sheep meadow in the rain in the Cotswolds. My shoes will never recover from this. But it showed that she had this way, she has this way of using concession, this tool of using the other person's words against them, but in a way that's like an improv, yes and technique you know, saying, yeah, and, and then adding to the conversation in such a way that brings things around to your point of view. She is a master at that. You, you'll be arguing with her without knowing she's actually arguing with you. Um, you just find yourself, oh, this is cool. I'm totally winning here. And at the end, you realize you've agreed to something you never started out to agree with. That is the ultimate, you know, master persuader. And she gets people to give millions, literally millions of dollars for this medical center and medical school in the United States using those very techniques. I mean, she's she's as good as it gets. <laughs> you make it sound like we should have invited her for this podcast. <laughs> uh, she'd be terrible. I'm much better. <laughs> Trust me. Uh, uh, yeah, you're, you're the famous book author. Uh, yeah. So I, I think we we need to be respectful of your time because we are not the only show act of your day, I, I suppose. Um, but there's one thing I'm dying to, to hear, hear the answer to. What is the book How to Argue with a Cat about? I heard that it, that you made a whole audience uh, uh, sniffing each other necks or licking each other necks. I, I forgot. But uh, what what is that book actually about that you presented there? So I've been, it's a number of people have been asking for a simpler introduction to rhetoric than thank you for arguing, which I made as popular and approachable as I could. But, you know, people get PhDs in this subject. So my wife said, you know, you should 
someday write a book with cat in the title because people will buy a book without even knowing what it's about if it has the word cat in the title. The reason she said that is that we have a good friend who was the longtime foreign affairs editor for the New York Times, really respectable guy, who bought this beautiful farm in Vermont with, using the proceeds of his best-selling book, The Cat Who Went Around the World. This guy had written highly acclaimed books that sold tens and tens of copies on Russia and China. But you know, when he finally writes a book with cat in the title, I don't think anybody ever read the book. You know, it just everybody bought it. So I uh, that was one motivation was just put cat in the title, doesn't matter what it is. But the other was that, you know, it's interesting, cats don't actually talk. And I realized that some of the the skills of persuasion that people have trouble getting around to is the nonverbal parts of argument, like timing you know, body language, an ability to think tribally in creative ways, all the things that cats as really good domestic predators do. And so I thought it would be great to get people to think differently from logic and words, to, to get into the whole rhetorical mindset that way. And that's, that's why I wrote this book. It's a slim book. I had this partner in the UK who wrote hilarious illustrations so but you don't even have to read the book. You just look at the pictures, buy the book. It's got cat in the title. You know, it's everything you could possibly want. As I said, I bought it right away. Well, I'm a fanboy anyway, so I'm not sure if that counts much. But I encourage our listeners to look into your books, uh, no matter what you publish. And especially when it has cat in the title. Um, I also, I'm a big fan, I have to say, of uh, the original um first book i think that uh that you published thank you for arguing that was my entry drug um i found that brilliant uh word hero also is a lot of fun and sebastian is always on that journey to eternity sebastian you should read that book because there's one pathway in there how you can make at least your ideas travel time that's true well i, I have another book that i'm working on now um about how to how to make yourself live forever by exercising and eating well And it's, so it's a book of self-persuasion. And so Sebast Sebastian, I'll make sure you get a copy when I finally write that stupid book. Great. All right. So we went full circle. We started with your books. We end with your books. How to Argue with a Cat is the latest one. All of them are very worthwhile your time. Thank you so much, Jay, uh, to, to take out that much time out of your busy schedule. I really appreciate it. It was a wonderful experience for us. Hope it was fun for you too. I really enjoyed it. Let's do this again. Let's have a debate. Let's do this anytime. Thank you very much for your time today already. All right. We'll see you guys. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you again. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye bye. Bye. So that was it. Not today's debate, but today's special. We hope you liked it as much as we did. Let us know, but there are no voting buttons on today's episode because it's not a debate. So you have to write something. You can do so on Twitter to debate podcast, or maybe even better, you follow the link to the episode's webpage where you find, among other things, the video of Jay making a whole audience sniff each other, the links to Jay's books, A video of Dan Carlin explaining the seven words you cannot say on US TV. And a beautiful comment box that you could use to write some feedback for us. Are there any topics you want to hear us debating over? Do you like to hear more specials? What kind of specials? We are a little bit hungry for your feedback, I have to say. So maybe do us a favor. All right. Have a wonderful day. Take care and bye-bye. Well, you haven't lived until you've been to a Polish sausage festival in Chicago. Um, I, once, uh, I once was training for a marathon and I went on a run out of my hotel and three blocks later found myself in the middle of a Polish festival and three pints of beer and five or six sausages later, I found myself staggering back to the hotel. I was supposed to have run 15 miles. I ended up covering maybe, I don't know, three quarters of a mile. <laughs> But my heart rate was awesome. <laughs>
Do you, do you know how few fanboys an argument guy has? <laughs> <laughs> I think that I think that says something about you, Dirk. Actually, but I'll I'll take it. I love that. That's one of the best beginnings to any humor is to tell them you're funny. I do that all the time. <laughs> it just it just kills them. 